the day of the Lord. Uh, this phrase is mentioned at least five times in the book of Joel. Sometimes it refers to a historic judgment on the people of God, and then also other times it refers to judgment that comes against the enemies of God. And so both can be used, the day of the Lord can be used in both of those situations. Last week, we talked about the need for those who had been lulled to sleep by drunkenness and other sins to wake up. And it was great that some of the, the songs that we sang this morning were, uh, we were singing, wake up, it's time to awake, awaken and to, to get up from our slumber. Today, we're going to spend some time focusing on the need for us to express sorrow for the right reasons. And so today's message is called, What Makes You Sad? Let's read Joel chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up, the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. This is the word of God. I'm going to show you a picture this morning and see who can recognize who this might be. That is the face of Abraham Lincoln. I want to tell you a little bit about Abraham Lincoln's story. Most, some of you who are historians will already know these things, but maybe some of you don't know uh, the rest of the story. So he was born in 1809. At, uh, at 1816, at age seven, he was forced to work because his family was expelled from where they were living. In 1818, he lost his mother. In 1828, he lost his sister. In 1831, he opened his first business and went bankrupt. In 1832, he stood in the legislative elections and lost. In 1833, he borrowed money to open another business and went bankrupt again. In 1835, he met a wonderful woman. He falls in love with her, with her he gets engaged to her, and she dies. In 1836, he entered a dark period of his life, deep depression. He remains bedridden for six consecutive months, but he gets up. He gets up, and in that same year of 1836, he runs in the legislative elections again, and he loses again. In 1840, he presents himself as an elector, and he loses. In 1842, he met the woman he would end his life with. They fall in love, get engaged, get married, and she gives him four children, and they lose three. In 1843, he appeared at the Congress and lost. In 1845, he appeared again at the Congresses and lost again. In 1850, his son died. In 1854, he ran for the Senate and lost. In 1856, he ran for the Vice President. He didn't even get 100 votes. In 1858, he ran again for the Senate and lost again. And in 1860... Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States of America. He was elected for two consecutive terms, but we all know he was assassinated in the beginning of his second term. But having said that, he was one of the most respected and impactful presidents in the history of these United States. So when you hear that story about Abraham Lincoln's life, I have a question for you. What part of that story makes you feel sad? What part of that story causes you to say, oh my goodness, I can't believe he went through that. Maybe it was all of the failed attempts and elections that he went through. Maybe it was the fact that he tried to open two businesses that failed epically. Maybe it was the fact that his first wife 
died before they could be married. Maybe it was the fact that he lost children. Maybe it was the fact that he lost his own life. There's a lot of things in there that you could choose to be sad about, aren't there? Our passage today begins with the picture. It's an image of the type of response that should be given to the devastation that the day of the Lord brings. It says that we should lament like a virgin, wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. Sackcloth is a rough, coarse cloth made into a bag-like garment. It was worn to symbolize what? Deep grief or contrition or repentance before God. It was often used by prophets to symbolize their brokenness in the face of the message of calamity and judgment that they were having to deliver. And the husband of her youth is a virgin betrothed to be married, but her husband died before they got married. Was her sense of loss simply about losing him in that moment? Or was her sense of loss also about her dreams, her hopes, her ambitions for the future? Because most little girls that I know about dream about things like a house with a picket fence and three children who are all very obedient. And a husband that says, yes, dear. No, I don't know. That's the the modern, that's the contemporary version of the dream. But growing old together, now that Amy and I have, have, we have four children of our own, and now we have these three grandchildren. And I have to say, I love my kids. I would never want them to be replaced. (laughs) But if I had known... (laughs) What gift grandchildren were. Wow. Anyway, I love you all very much, and I appreciate you. And thank you for bringing these children into our lives. We are different because of them. So when you read a passage like this, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it that we should be sorry about? What should we feel bad about? Listen to that last line of the passage, gladness dries up from the children of man. You ever experienced that in your lifetime? Maybe you're experiencing it right now where joy and gladness seem to have disappeared. Seems like there's no way that you can even locate them or find them. They're so far away from you. So in this story, in this book, in this prophecy, in this poem, What is it that God's trying to get across to the nation of Israel? What is it that they should be sad about? So let's start. I'm going to give us four categories of things that we can be sad about. The first one is, does loss of stuff make you sad? And you don't have to be honest with me, but be honest with yourself, right? And if you're not honest with yourself, ask. If you're married, ask your spouse. They'll tell you. They won't tell you, your children will tell you. What is the truth? Does loss of stuff make us sad? Now, of course, you know, if any of you have been through a disaster where everything was taken from you, either through a storm or through, um, you know, through fire, whatever that is, that's that's a horrible thing for anybody to go through, right? Uh, Have you ever asked yourself the question, and this is always rhetorical, but what is the, if you could go back into your, your burning house and get one thing and rescue one thing from the house, what would it be? What would you choose to take forward with you if everything else was destroyed? It's an interesting exercise to think through things like that. And really what it's dealing with is what, is, what has the highest priority in our lives, right? In this country... We have a lot of stuff. And here's the proof of it. When you drive into most neighborhoods in Knox County, most houses have garages, but there are not cars in the garages. (laughs) There are piles of stuff, boxes that have not been opened in many, many years, but they have something on them that says, you know, uh, 
keepsake or Christmas or whatever it is. But, uh, and, and not only do we have that, but then also in most neighborhoods, in most yards, there's also what? There's a shed or a storage building where there's more stuff that's kept. Right? Am I, are we saying amen or oh me, right? And now, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's an explosion around Knox County of storage facilities everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. I don't know what it is that people are storing. I don't know what they know that I'm not made aware of yet that I need to be storing. Um, is it ammunition? I don't know what it is. I'm just throwing it out there. We're in Tennessee. You never know. Um, but it's like, how much stuff do we need to have for it to be enough stuff? You know, if you ask a millionaire, millionaire today, how much money is enough? You know what they'll usually say? 10 million. You ask a 10 millionaire, <laughs> what, what, how much would be enough? How much is enough? 100 million. And it goes, you know, goes and goes and goes. How many zeros do we have to have in order for us to be content and satisfied? Now we're thinking about the Israelites here totally. Do not take this as something we should apply to our own lives. (laughs) So the priests in this passage might have mourned because of loss of items for offerings. You realize that the priests' livelihood came from the offerings that were brought. Leviticus 18.1 says, remember that the Levitical priests, that is the whole of the tribe of Levi, will receive no allotment of land among the other tribes in Israel. Instead, the priests and Levites will eat from the special gifts given to the Lord, for that is their share. So we could spiritualize it, and we'll talk about later, they could have actually been upset about the fact that they weren't going to be able to worship God. But if that's the case, then why was God asking them to repent? Seems like there must have been some alternative things going on in their hearts and minds. The farmers might have mourned because of the loss of income based on the destruction of their produce. I mean, mama needs a new pair of shoes, and how is that going to happen if we have no corn to sell? The fields are destroyed, the ground itself mourns, and it goes on and on. It talks about the wheat, the barley, the vine, the fig tree, pomegranate, palm, and apple, and all the trees of the field, everything devastated, completely devastated. Who was the bad lion in The Lion King? Scar. You remember the scene when he takes rule and authority and all of a sudden everything that had been lush and beautiful and green and just spectacular and perfect was now what? The ground was like literally opening up from dryness, desert. That's what it was like. A New Testament example of what I'm talking about is found in Mark 10, 17. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied with an upbeat tone, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a little boy. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Aren't you glad about that? He says, there's still one thing you haven't done. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. He had a lot of stuff. And I would like to even say a a different interpretation of this would be, 
his possessions had him. Because what would have been the best choice for this man? To follow Jesus wherever he would lead, lead him. So is it wrong to have possessions? I have possessions. I'm very grateful for my vehicles, for my house, for the clothes that I wear that are very stylish. Thankful to <laughs> my wife. Uh, <laughs> That's debatable, I know. We'll talk about it later. Okay. Just let me be me. It's not wrong to have stuff, but if stuff has us, if we find ourselves not wanting to obey God because of the stuff that we have or the stuff that we want, then something's wrong. I grew up in, a, uh, in the Word of Faith background, and one of the things that unfortunately got twisted in that way of thinking was that a, a rich Christian was the Christian who was closest to God. And so the more that you had, the more, you know, the higher quality of things that you had showed a level of spirituality and closeness to God that helps you to look at other people and say, well, at least we don't look like, live like those people. And the problem with that is, with any kind of scenario like that, is that a very few of pe people got very wealthy off of the gifts of those who were trying to somehow get good enough with God for him to bless them for the way that they had given to him and to others. What a travesty. What a shame when the gospel message gets deflated and distracted and and moved away from its foundation just so that we can be, uh, we, can, we can kind of live our philosophy of life. So let's move on. Second one, does loss of tradition make you sad? Loss of tradition. The priests weren't going to be able to perform their ceremonial duties. That's what they were known for. That's what they did. That's who they were. The farmers weren't going to be able to throw harvest parties any longer. The festivals was what they were responsible for. It was a big deal in Jewish tradition. These happened regularly, and they were celebratory, and people spent days and days together, really supposed to have been worshiping God and thanking Him for the harvest. Exodus 29 says, These are the sacrifices you are to offer regularly on the altar. Each day, offer two lambs that are a year old, one in the morning and the other in the evening. With one of them, offer two quarts of choice flour mixed with one quart of pure oil of pressed olives. Also, offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Offer the other lamb in the evening along with the same offerings of flour and wine as in the morning. It will be a pleasing aroma, a special gift presented to the Lord. These burnt offerings are to be made each day from generation to generation. Offer them in the Lord's presence at the tabernacle entrance. There I will meet with you and speak with you. These traditions that they had were very important. But the tradition itself can become the idol that we serve. Worship has to appear a certain way in order for it to be true worship. I have to read a certain number of chapters of, Bi of the Bible at a particular setting in order to be truly spiritual. I have to um, make other people feel uncomfortable while I loudly pray in tongues in public settings because that's my tradition. That's what I do. I, um, I reject anybody who rejects Christ and they're going to know about it because I'm going to let them know about it. It's my tradition. I grew up in a church where they told me that everything that I did literally was going to send me to hell. Anybody ever, did anybody experience that? Yeah, if you went to the movies on Saturday and the Jesus came back Saturday night, you'd be able to sit and enjoy the rest of that movie because you've been left behind. <laughs> we've, all, we've all been there. We've heard the songs. We've sang the songs read the books, right? So the, uh, the observances of these offerings had de de degenerated in Joel's day so much 
that they were just a routine. They were just a tradition. It was just a ritual. The spiritual part of it had diminished completely. The desire to be in the presence of God, which was the whole purpose for the sacrificial system in the first place. The Israelites had made these occasions for drunkenness. Uh, God had taken away the privilege of offering that which symbolized purity of devotion. The cutting off of the sacrifice was a severe step, though it should also have warned the people of their grave condition. The third thing is, does a loss of reputation make you sad? So does a loss of stuff make you sad? Does a loss of tradition, the things that you have held on to, as being very important, even though they may not be important to God? And then thirdly, does your loss of your reputation make you sad? I have to appear a certain way in front of other people, even if I'm literally dying on the inside. I will not, I cannot expose who I really am or what I'm really dealing with. The priests were only valuable to the people as long as they could perform sacrifices. If that was removed from them, what was everybody else going to think about them? Not much. The farmers were valuable as long as they could provide food and drink, but when the food and the drink drink ran out, no longer was anybody coming to visit the farmers because they weren't needed anymore. Their reputation of being the best grape grower in, the, in all of Israel didn't matter when all the grapes and the vines were destroyed. I want to tell you a story quickly from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 15. King Saul, we all know that Saul was the first king that Israel chose, that God allowed them to have as a king. Um, and King Saul one time was told by a prophet, Samuel, the Lord told him, that he was to attack the Amalekites and destroy everything, completely destroy everything. So uh, Saul went into battle, attacked the Amalekites and destroyed some things. But he kept King Agag alive, along with the best of the animals and anything that was considered valuable, they kept and brought it back with them to the promised land. Uh, So Samuel approaches Saul one day, uh, and Saul says, Hey, Samuel, welcome to the palace. I have uh, done everything that you asked me to do. We attacked the Amalekites. They have been destroyed, utterly destroyed. And Samuel says, "I, I would love to have been an Old Testament prophet, because you can exercise the gift of sarcasm and have it be spiritual. In some way, he says to him, then what is all the bleeding of sheep and and goats and the lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul quickly says, well, the army, you know, the guys in the army, they were, they fought so hard. They were so, you know, vigilant and, and, and they just, they wanted to bring back some things so that we could sacrifice them as an offering to the Lord. That sounds great, doesn't it? Really nice. Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now, if you read the rest of the story, it's interesting because it's almost like Saul didn't hear that last line. He has rejected you as king. Because Saul's uh, next line is he says, uh, Yeah, I sinned, but it's because of the people out there. I was really afraid of them. These guys really, I mean, they went out there. They wanted to bring this stuff back, and I was afraid to say no. You understand, Samuel, you've been around some of these guys, right? I mean, you know, uh, Malekali over there, I mean, he's, he's always after the gold. And his sister, 
She always wants to sacrifice the best of the best. I'm just throwing out names. I have no idea. But you're supposed to go along with me on the journey. Encourage me as I attempt to make this uh, alive and meaningful. Okay. Um, So Saul acknowledges he's afraid of the people. He's afraid that he's going to lose his reputation with the people. So Saul begs Samuel to go with him so that he can worship the Lord. Samuel tells Saul that God has rejected him as king and given it to another. Again, again, encourage, letting him know. Samuel tries to leave at this point. Saul, like a little baby boy, grabs a hold of Samuel's garment and holds on until it begins to rip. He is not going to let Samuel go. And in verse 30, it says, Then Saul pleaded again, I know I have sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Hello? (laughs) Worship the Lord your God? Yes, that was the problem. Saul was concerned about his reputation before the people, not about Samuel's God. Samuel, you go do what you're going to do. That's fine. Just take me with you. Make me look good in front of my people. I can't be embarrassed. Here's the reality. The people probably already knew (laughs) that Saul was not what he thought he was. So if a loss of stuff, tradition, and reputation makes us sad... What does that say about what is most important to us? One of the ways that we can evaluate what makes us sad is actually to do the opposite. What are the, if you were to be asked, give us the top five happiest moments of your life, the moments that were the greatest joy, uh, that created the greatest joy in your life, what would those be? Let's even give it 10. Let's spread it out. If you could name the top 10 happiest, most joy-filled moments in your life, what would those moments be? What would be the circumstance surrounding those moments? And if you could rank them, how would they be ranked? I'm not here to tell you what that list might look like. I'm just asking you to consider, as I'm considering, what does my list look like? So the last thing is, does loss of relationship make you sad? The priest and farmer's relationship with God doesn't seem to be as high a priority as their stuff, their tradition, and their reputation. It seems like they're mostly concerned up to this point in time with how they're going to appear before other people, not how they're going to appear before a holy God. My friends, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And unless the fear of the Lord is allowed to make a comeback in our hearts, in our lives, and in the church, not just this church, the church as a whole, we will continue to focus on the wrong things. We will not make choices and decisions that are wise choices and decisions. We will build bigger barns. We will continue to establish ways of doing things that set us apart from other people to make us cutting edge or whatever the the word is of the day. We will continue to make sure that we cover up anything of ourselves that appears to be undone in the hopes that somehow every Sunday for an hour and a half to two hours, we can convince everybody else around us that we're all good. Man, this sounded so much happier when I was writing it. I don't understand. (laughs) I don't understand what happened there. My friends, I'm just being honest with you. I do not fear the Lord as much as I should. And remember, we're not talking about a fear of destruction, although he's proven He's capable of doing that. But I have a fear 
You know, people have a fear of missing out. I have a fear of missing out on what God is doing currently in the earth. And if I'm so wrapped up in my own way of doing things, my own way of thinking, my own way of living, and my own priority list, that that's my focus, I can totally miss the still small voice of God speaking to me and directing me. So the priests and the farmers didn't seem at this point in time to be bothered. Now we're going to see in the future, I won't give it away too much, but there is a change of heart that is coming. And I thank God for that. The lack of offerings reflected the greatest calamity for Israel, not just because of the loss of grain or wine, but because of the loss of the promise of the presence of God. You see, those sacrifices, those offerings that were given, twice a day, were what was prescribed by God for his nation, his people, to be able to be in somewhat of a relationship with him before Christ would come and change everything. But it didn't seem at first that that bothered them very much. My question for you is one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture that I'm aware, that I My personal thought is the one about Samson where it says that he awoke and he did not know that the Holy Spirit had departed from him. He was so uh, hardened, so focused in on his purpose, his plan, his way of doing things, that he didn't even notice that the presence of God was gone. I don't know about you, but I have to be in the presence of God. I know that he lives in us by his spirit, and that gives us access anytime we need it, all the time, 24-7. But taking the time to prioritize that and remember it is something that I need help with. You see, far worse than the locust plague was the condition of the people's spiritual lives. The very worship of God was being compromised. And the first rule that God gave was what? Shall have no other gods before me. What we're actually talking about here is idolatry. Stuff can be the thing that we worship. Tradition or ways of doing things can be the thing that we worship. It's sad to me when we go into foreign mission fields as Americans, and I've been on teams where the teams thought if they would just listen to us, we could really tell them how to do this. What? How about bringing it down a notch, Johnny, and listening to, uh, listening to what their history is? And how they've figured out how to do the things that they're doing based on their life experience, right? Hosea 2 gives a description of what the the atmosphere was like around worship at the time. She doesn't realize it. it was I who gave her everything she has. This is the prophet Hosea talking about the nation of Israel. The grain, the new wine, the olive oil. I even gave her silver and gold but she gave all my gifts to Baal. It's another God, an idol. But now I will take back the ripened grain and new wine I generously provided each harvest season. I will take away the wool and linen clothing I gave her to cover cover her nakedness. I will strip her naked in public while all her lovers look on. No one will be able to rescue her from my hands." I will put an end to her annual festivals, her new moon celebrations, and her Sabbath days, all of her appointed festivals. I will destroy her grapevines and fig trees, things she claims her lovers gave her. I will let them grow into tangled thickets where only wild animals will eat the fruit. I will punish her for all those times when she burned incense to her images of Baal, when she put on her earrings and jewels and went out to look for her lovers, but forgot all about me, says the Lord. 
You see, the nation of Israel was crying out to God, give us what we deserve. We are your people. We're your children. We're doing the sacrifices. We're doing the stuff. Give us what we deserve. That's the wrong prayer to pray if you're deceived. They were so deceived about the condition of their hearts and the way that they were practicing their form of religion. The point that to ask God to give them what they deserve meant the very punishment that they were receiving. God is not about stuff. He can just sneeze and something new is, boom, formed. If any of you have ever fished in the ocean and caught species of creatures that you have never thought could ever exist or did exist, you know there's a creative God that is very capable of doing what he's, he needs to do, of giving us what we need. This phenomenon, the day of the Lord, the Israelites were always expecting that to be God punishing their enemies. And how many of you know there will come a day in time where Satan himself and all of the demons that have ever tried to harass, kill, destroy, steal from us, they will all bow their knees and loudly declare that Jesus is Lord to Jesus the Lord. And they will be thrown away to utter destruction and damnation forever and ever and ever. That's good news. That is good news. The problem is that in this life, in this day, in this time, and in this hour, we tend at times to listen to their little squeaky voices, whispering thoughts of lust, greed, covetousness, anger, all of those thoughts that we embrace as our own and say, I deserve to feel this way because I'm a victim. I've been wronged. My friends, the only victim in this story was Jesus Christ. He took it all. He took it all. Let me finish by just telling you one last story, David's story. So David commits adultery with another man's wife. David was the replacement for Saul, so he was the second king of Israel. He had to wait a while for that, but he did. Uh, so he commits adultery with another man's wife. She becomes pregnant. He has this great plan. He brings her husband home from war and says, go spend time with your wife, you know, so that he could say that she became pregnant by her husband. Well, her husband was such a righteous man and so faithful to God and to the call on his life as a military man that he refused to go upstairs and enjoy the pleasures of home. Instead, he stayed down at the entrance to the house and slept there. And so uh, David says to himself, well, got to deal with this somehow. So he sends him to the front lines of the battle, knowing that he was going to be killed. And he was killed. Another prophet named Nathan shows up at David's house and says, hey, there's this little kid that has one little sheep. And this mean guy came in and took the one little sheep from the one little boy because he wanted the sheep for himself. David is furious. And he's ready. He said, tell me who it is. I will go and kill this punk. And you may not know where this saying came from, but this is the, in the original Hebrew. It said, you demand. <laughs> and he pointed at David, not you, Scott, pointed at David <clears throat> and said, you are the man. Let's see if David's response was any different from Saul's. David said immediately, I have sinned against the Lord. Not against Nathan, 
not against even the, the crimes that were done to Uriah, I think it was Uriah, the, the man, and also Bathsheba, the woman, not, not any, I have sinned against the Lord. And if you wonder what that depth of repentance looked like, you just have to read the words of Psalm 51, 10 through 12. And you can hear it maybe as a song. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. You know what God said about this man, David, this sinner, this murderer, adulterer? He said that David was a man after his own heart, not because of the sin, because of his heart for relationship. His highest priority was his relationship with God. Even though God wouldn't allow him to build a temple, he built a tent in his backyard so that he could bring the Ark of the Covenant and have a place to go and worship God every day. He's not a priest, but he worships God around the Ark of the Covenant every day because he knows that the Lord is the secret to his success in life. All of us, my friends, are born dead in our sins and trespasses. All of us. We are not able to have a real right relationship with God, no matter how hard we try, and we have tried. Religion teaches you to try. Jesus came as a representative of God and man to live the life that we couldn't live and to die the death that we should have died for the sins that we have committed. Those who have by the power of the Holy Spirit experienced the transformation that comes by repenting of our sins and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ are made right with God. God does this. God did this because his greatest desire, the thing that brings him joy, is when he has right relationship with his creation with us. God desires that we would be in right relationship with him so much that he sent his only son to be killed. Those of us who have experienced this transformation in our lives look at loss in different lights, different lenses. Habakkuk 3 says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the gas prices are higher than $5, even though milk is doubled in price, even though I can't find formula, even though, you get, the, you get what I'm saying? And the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights, the high places. This should be our story. This should be our testimony. This should be the relationship that we are fighting for the most. This should be the thing that causes us to react and respond when we face difficulty, and loss. It should be a song on our hearts, a song of joy and victory. I think of all of the martyrs before us that have actually thanked God for the chance, the privilege of being able to give their lives for the sake of the righteous one. How in the world does a person get to that point? And the last verse is Philippians 4. It's a New Testament version. Not that I was ever in need, this is Paul speaking, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me 
strengths. My friends, if Christ is with us, if Christ is for us, if Christ is around us, if Christ is above us and beneath us, if Christ is in us, we're going to be okay. No matter what Satan throws at us, no matter what this world throws at us, our relationship with the God of the universe is the thing that will bring us through. Amen. Would you stand with me? Why don't you just take just a minute, just you and the Lord, and ask him, what is it that you want me to take away from this message this morning? What do you want me to do? What's my, my practical step that you want me to take? Just take a minute and let the Lord speak to you. Father, I pray that you would speak to us. What steps do you want us to take in the coming week as we contemplate and consider the entirety of what you've done here this morning, Lord? Help it not to be just words that have fallen on stones. Help your word to grow deep and produce the results you desire in Jesus' name. So Father, I thank you for this amazing group of people, Lord God. And the thing that makes them most amazing is not their stuff. It's not even their, their philosophy of life or their tradition. It's not their reputation, even though their reputations are great. Lord, the thing that makes this group of people great is their relationship with you. And Father, I pray that you would help us in the difficult and the easy to keep our eyes focused on the prize, the prize of having you with us now and in us now by your Spirit. But Lord, there is a day, not very long from now, when we will see you face to face. Lord, let us long for the day of your return and let us be busy about your business until that day comes. And I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that he would make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. I pray that he would lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.